Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From now on, we will hold the international seminar Exploring the Potential of Forest-Based Disaster Risk De Reductions, sponsored by the Forest and Forest Products Research Institute of the Forest Research and Management Organization. I will be serving as your moderator today. I am Yasko Inoue of the Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center, Forest and Forest Products Research Institute. I'm glad to meet you all. Today, more than 420 people from around the world have registered to participate in the seminar. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules. This seminar will be conducted with simultaneous interpretation in Japanese and English. You can select either Japanese English or the original sound as you like from the menu at the bottom of the Zoom screen. It is also possible to change the channel later on. Today's program and profiles of speakers were sent by email in advance and are also posted on the page for the seminar on the website of the Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center. The the Q&A function of Zoom will be used for questions in the seminar. Please note that each speaker will be asked to answer the questions during the panel discussion. However, we may not be able to respond to all questions due to time constraints. First, on behalf of the organizers, the Forest and Forest Products Research Institute, Dr. Yasumasa Hirata, director of the FFPRI Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center, will like to address you. Thank you for watching the international seminar organized by FFPRI, the Red Plus and FDRR Research and Development Center exploring the potential of forest-based disaster risk reduction. I am the director of the center, Yasumasa Hirata. Now in the wake of the spread of COVID-19, we decided to host the seminar online. I would like to thank the healthcare professionals for their efforts and I do hope the pandemic will end quickly. Now, in October last year, Prime Minister Suga declared that Japan would be carbon neutral by 2050. In the United States, President Biden has made a major shift to returning back to the Paris Agreement and tackling climate change. With these developments, it is hoped that the momentum will build toward mitigating climate change. But in the meantime, the development in Amazon region is proceeding at the worst pace ever. An impact on climate change is concerned. As sea levels rise and extreme climate events become more apparent, natural disasters associated with climate change become intensified. How to mitigate these natural disasters is an important issue for us living with climate change. As the seminar title suggests, we aim to explore the potential of forest-based disaster risk reduction. Speakers from the international organizations and countries will report on international trends, specific technical approaches, and challenges in implementing strategies of FDRR. So session one will focus on international trend in strategic practice of FDRR. Presenters are Mr. Osamu Mizuno, Principal Fellow of Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. Dr. Thomas Hoffer, Senior Forestry Officer of the Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, FAO. Dr. Manzo Kumal Hazarika, Director of the Center for Geographical Information at the Asian following Institute session two of will focus on the policy and technical approaches and the challenges of each country with the speakers. 
Dr. Fu Tan Phon, Deputy Director of the International Cooperation Division of the Vietnamese Academy of Forest Sciences. We are currently conducting a joint research with the Academy. Mr. C. Tu An, Head of the Watershed Management Division, Forest Department of Myanmar. We jointly worked on the Red Plus project last year. And Mr. Okamoto of our center. Finally, in a panel discussion, all of the speakers will join and discuss the needs and challenges of the disaster risk reduction potential of forests. Although time is limited to only two hours, we would like to make this seminar useful to find the direction and survive in the era of climate change. I hope you will stay with us throughout the seminar. Thank you very much. Next, we have received a video message from Mr. Koji Hongo, the Director General of the Forestry Agency. We ask for your attention. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Thomas Hoffer, Senior Forest Officer, FAO, Dr. Vu Tan Fong, Deputy Director, International Cooperation Department, Vietnam Academy of Forest Sciences, and all the speakers and audience for their participation in today's international seminar. I would also like to express my sincere appreciation to the Forestry and Forest Products Research Institute, the organizer of this seminar, for their efforts to hold this seminar with the participation of such a large number of attendees, despite the various restrictions imposed by the new coronavirus pandemic. In September last year, the Forest and Forest Products Research Institute established the Research and Development Center for Red Plus and Forest-Based Disaster Risk Reduction. I have heard that the center will work on developing technologies, etc., for disaster prevention and mitigation using forests, in addition to the Red Plus-based mitigation measures that have been developed to date to contract climate change. I hope that the establishment of the center will be an opportunity for further development of such research. In the midst of a major outbreak of the new coronavirus infection, there is a growing global concern about climate change. At the Climate Ambition Summit held last December, it was pointed out that social and economic recovery from the coronavirus requires a green pathway that emphasizes the environment and is consistent with the SDGs. In October last year, Prime Minister Suga declared Japan's intention to become carbon neutral by 2050. In the field of forestry as well, we are determined to contribute to a decarbonized society through the promotion of appropriate forest maintenance, conservation, and utilization of timber. In the fight against climate change, not only mitigation but also adaptation is important. In recent years, heavy rains and frequent typhoons have increased the risk of mountain disasters and storm surge disasters worldwide. And there is a growing momentum for eco-DRR, or disaster prevention and mitigation using ecosystems. Forests themselves are part of the ecosystem and have functions such as preventing mountain disasters and recharging water sources. So their role in the field of disaster prevention and mitigation is becoming increasingly important. I'm convinced that forests will play a central role in nature-based solutions for adaptation. It is expected that the international trends in disaster prevention and mitigation using forests, policy and technical approaches, and issues in various countries, and future directions will be discussed at this seminar. I believe that this seminar will be a very meaningful opportunity to share knowledge about the countries that have experienced natural disasters, including Japan, and to exchange opinions on the future possibilities of disaster prevention and mitigation using forests, which will bring many insights to the various parties involved and provide suggestions on the direction of use of forests as a measure to adapt to climate change. The Forestry Agency 
will continue to actively contribute to the development and dissemination of technology for disaster prevention and mitigation using forests, referring to the results of today's discussion. In closing, I would like to thank you all again for your attendance and express my sincere wish that today's seminar will be fruitful for all the participants and contribute to further development of measures for forest-based disaster risk reduction. Thank you very much, Director General Hongo. From now, Dr. Toru Nakashizuka, President of the Forest Research and Management Organization, will explain the purpose of today's international seminar and deliver a keynote speech. Let us welcome him now. I am Toru Asano, the Director General of FFPRI and the President of the Forest Research Management Organization. I also use my academic name, Naka Shizuka. Thank you very much for joining us today at the symposium on exploring the potential of forest-based disaster risk reduction. This is the very first symposium of the Red Plus and FDRR Research and Development Center, which was only established last year. If many of you could help us, we would be extremely grateful. Without further ado, I would like to start my presentation. I want to talk about the potential of forest-based DRR, or FDRR. Before I joined the FFPRI, I was at Tohoku University. It was when the Great, Earth Great East Japan earthquake hit. So I will speak based on my experiences as a member of the Reconstruction Committee and on my involvement in reconstruction process. This is a photo of coastal forest development after the earthquake in Sendai City. On the right is the sea, and the tsunami flew in here in this direction. Now, many pine trees have been planted since then. Recently, Social capital development and national land planning using natural capital focused on green infrastructure and eco-DRR, EBA, or ecosystem-based adaptation, and nature-based solutions. Various terms but similar concepts have been proposed. One of these concepts is forest-based disaster risk reduction, or FDRR, which we want to discuss today. Now, green infrastructure is not only about disaster prevention and mitigation, but also about making the best use of natural capital and ecosystems, including infrastructure for our daily lives. NBS is the broadest, and it is about solving social problems. FDRR is somewhere in between, and it considers disaster prevention and mitigation based on forests. This photo shows the town of Taro in Iwate Prefecture, where there had been a seawall over 10 meters high, which was destroyed by the tsunami. A seawall over 10 meters high seems very high when you actually go there and see it. The fact that it was destroyed gave us a new appreciation of the destructive power of tsunamis. This is another place. Kesenuma City in Miyagi Prefecture, a huge dike has been built. The previous dike had a small base and was destroyed. So now they built a dike with a very wide base on a very large area. This is a 50 meter high dike with a huge base of 90 meters which on the other hand has also reduced coastal forest and sand dunes. However, in the reconstruction process, there have been several attempts of using FDRR. 
This photo shows the famous Takada Matsubara Pine Forest in Echizen Takata City, Iwate Prefecture, before the earthquake. It was well known for its white sand and green pines, so it had been designated as a national, national scenic spot. But it was destroyed by the tsunami along with the whole town. FDRR, or hybrid technology, was used in the reconstruction of this place. This is a memorial park created by the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport. There was a lot of discussion about this. At first, it was argued that we should not restore the pine forest, but the seawall. But the pine forest was so dear to the local community they wished to revive the traditional pine forest, so the decision was made to build the seawall and also restore the pine forest on the seaside. And on the land side, the beach was restored and the park was built to commemorate the recovery of the earthquake and tsunami. The picture shows the restored pine forest on the reclaimed land, although the trees have not yet fully grown. On the land side, the seawall is covered with earth and grass to preserve the marshland. So this is, in a way, a hybrid technology of FDRR and artificial concrete. Now this shows what was discussed after the tsunami in Southeast Asia about the role of mangroves. There was a lot of discussion after the Aceh earthquake and tsunami about what role the mangroves were playing. The diagram above is ecosystem-based options. In the far end, there is forest. We are talking about reducing the logging and reviving the vegetation along the river, including afforestation and keeping the mangroves. On the other hand, Unlike ecosystem or forest-based restoration, in the lower part of the diagram, you see building breakwaters to protect the area. Comparing the two options, the picture of green leaves is ecosystem options, and the bulldozer shows the engineering option or gray option which are sometimes referred to as gray infrastructure. This is a comparison of the construction and maintenance costs of these options. Clearly, the construction of green infrastructure or ecosystem or forest-based option is considered less expensive. One of the main features of FDRR, or ECHO-DRR, is that it is not limited to disaster risk reduction, but has many other secondary effects. This is a report from the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. For example, in terms of food production, we have green infrastructure, Compared to gray infrastructure and hybrid, green infrastructure is better for food production, for local people's livelihood, for climate change mitigation, and for water supply. And it's better for biodiversity. The use of green infrastructure or hybrid infrastructure is more effective than artificial concrete infrastructure in many ways. Each of these benefits can be expected to help achieve the SDGs. For example, in the case of Minami Sanriku, which was rebuilt after the Great East Japan earthquake, on the land side, the town has obtained FSC certification for its forest. And on the seaside, the oyster aquaculture has ASC certified. ASC certification. In other words, from land to sea, they are trying to rebuild their town using natural capital and the certifications for sustainable production. This is something 
that is impossible by gray infrastructure or artificial infrastructure alone. This can only be done by protecting ecosystems and preserving forests. So this is an example. The town hall built in that manner. What is unforgettable about the Great East Japan earthquake is this example. A Kimeria tree, the symbol of the community, was planted on the evacuation route, which revived the community and developed the reconstruction work. It shows that the forest and trees can provide spiritual support. I talked mainly about the tsunami, but in Nagano Prefecture, forests are built according to the topography of the area. Considering the selection of tree species and the combination of engineering techniques to determine what type of forest is best for the topology. This is how FDRR is promoted in Japan. And there are some of the features of FDRR and ECODRR. For example, a certainty of a single function is better in artificial infrastructure. However, when considering multiple functions, it is better to use ecosystems. In terms of avoiding environmental impact, ecosystems are better. And in terms of short and long-term employment, for short-term employment, artificial infrastructure is better. But for long-term employment, ecosystems and forest-based approaches are better. But let me talk about the challenges of FDRR at the end. The scientific evaluation of DRR is still lacking. There is also uncertainty about cost-benefit calculation. The big challenge is how to make decisions locally. I think that it is difficult to make a major decision after the fact, after a disaster. So it is necessary to think about this in advance in the regional plan. Therefore, I'd like to conclude my keynote speech with the expectation that everyone will talk about these points in today's symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. It will soon be 10 years since the Great Eastern Japan earthquake of March 11, 2011. The rebuilding process is still underway. We in Japan have certainly not forgotten the warm-hearted support and encouragement received from many countries and people around the world, and in particular from countries struggling with poverty and still requiring support. We received much warm-hearted support from them. We will never forget this. With this experience in mind, we would like to do our best to repay the kindness you have shown us by researching and developing better disaster pre prevention and mitigation technologies based on forests. From here, session one will be started. In session one, the theme will be International Trends in FDRR, Strategies and Practices, with presentations by three people. Mr. Mizuno, Dr. Hofer, Dr. Hazarika, please turn on the camera. Thank you. The speakers are Mr. Osama Mizuno of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, IGES, Dr. Manzul Kumar Hazarika of the Asian Institute of Technology, AIT, and Dr. Thomas Hoffer of the FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. For their profiles, please refer to the introductions of the speakers previously distributed. In session one, there will be an overview of how disaster prevention and mitigation, which are important elements of adaptation, are positioned within the framework of international climate change countermeasures, and in particular, how international organizations are working on forest-based disaster risk reduction. Mr. Mizuno, Dr. Hoffer, Dr. Hazarika, please turn off your cameras on Zoom. 
The first speaker, Mr. Osama Mizuno, Research Director and Principal Fellow of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategy, IGES, will deliver a presentation titled, Global Flirt Frameworks on Adaptation Such as the Paris Agreement, Including the Aspect of Disaster Risk Reduction. Let's welcome him. Hello, I'm Osamu Mizuno from IGES. I will discuss global frameworks on adaptation, such as Paris Agreement, including the aspect of disaster risk reduction. So my talk will be about the international position of the adaptation initiative. This is because the theme of this seminar, FDRR, is in the context of climate change. It's all about how forests can be used to address adaptation. I will start with a very brief description of what adaptation is. There are two main types of climate change action. One is mitigation, and the other is adaptation. Mitigation measures include measures to reduce the GHG emissions, while adaptation measures are about adjusting the way nature and society respond to the impacts of climate change that are already occurring or likely to occur. Therefore, when we think about adaptation, the starting point is the prediction of the impacts of climate change. As you can see in this diagram, the impact of climate change covers a wide range of sectors. Adaptation measures will therefore vary accordingly. You can also see from the diagram that many different sectors related to forests will be affected. There is also a wide range of measures from soft to hard measures. When considering disaster risk reduction, it is important to consider the combination of these various measures. Now that I have explained what adaptation is, let me go on to explain its place in the Paris Agreement. As you know, the Paris Agreement was adopted under the 2015 Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement is the substantive successor to the Kyoto Protocol, and it sets out how climate change measures should be implemented beyond 2020. A key feature is that it is designed to encourage countries to work together without clear distinction between developed and developing countries. The table below explains how adaptation is positioned in the Paris Agreement. You may have heard about the temperature targets, such as the 2 degree target or 1.5 degree target, but there are actually three objectives of the Paris Agreement. One of them is adaptation. Therefore, under the Paris Agreement, adaptation is a major pillar alongside mitigation measures. As you can see in the third point here, Article 7 of the Paris Agreement is entirely about adaptation. In the Kyoto Protocol, there are only a few provisions on adaptation, so I think it's a big change of direction that all of these 14 clauses are, are devoted to adaptation. What is particularly noteworthy is the global target in Article 7.1. That means all countries are encouraged to develop and monitor their own adaptation plans. So you can see that, at least in the Paris Agreement, adaptation is a major pillar along with mitigation. Now that I have explained the position of adaptation in the Paris Agreement, when it comes to forests, we also need to think about red. Red represent reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. It was originally developed as a mitigation measure, but the red initiatives can also be used as a basis for a range of adaptation measures. For example, the national forest monitoring systems and safeguard information systems 
developed for red can serve as a basis for future adaptation measures, so it is important to design future initiatives with this in mind. As for the Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26 is scheduled to be held in the United Kingdom in November this year. Nature will be a major theme at COP26, and there will be a great deal of focus placed on the role of forests. Already, the UK, the presidency, has committed a minimum of three billion pounds over the next five years to climate change action for the conservation and restoration of nature and biodiversity. In this sense, it is expected that this COP26 will be an opportunity to promote various measures for forest-based adaptation and forest-based DRR. This is the explanation of the position of adaptation in the Paris Agreement and the Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015, the same year that SDGs and the Sendai Framework for DRR were adopted, making it an important year for international environmental decisions. These frameworks and agreements are closely interconnected. And it's already clear that efforts of one framework will influence the others. Therefore, in promoting adaptation measures under the Paris Agreement, it is important to keep in mind the effects on the SDGs or the Sendai Framework for Disaster Reduction. Forests, in particular, have a variety of functions that can have diverse effects. So I think it is vital to bear these linkages in mind when considering forests. I'd like to give you just one example in particular on biodiversity and climate change adaptation. The Convention on Biological Diversity started referring to ecosystem-based adaptation around 2014. The EBA EcoDRR guidelines were published in 2018. Furthermore, COP15, scheduled for next year, is expected to include with the resilience to natural disasters as part of the proposed goals of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. It is therefore likely that the CBD framework will also see a significant shift in focus towards forest. The IPES, which provides scientific input to the CBD, had shown a number of developments. In recent years, a number of platforms have been set up in Japan in response to these developments. As you can see here, there are many different platforms, so one of the key points is how to organically link these platforms and how to make them work together. Finally, I'd like to summarize. First, adaptation to climate change is the major pillars one of the major pillars of climate change countermeasures alongside mitigation against the backdrop of the frequent and severe meteorological disasters in recent years. The Paris Agreement has given a proper position to adaptation. Secondly, adaptation measures are closely related to mitigation, DRR, SDGs, biodiversity conservation. Therefore, more attention will be paid to integrated approaches and forest providing multifaceted functions will be serving larger roles. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mizuno. In the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, it was agreed that adaptation would be given greater emphasis. We have learned that various discussions and initiatives are continuing to promote solutions that focus on nature and ecosystems such as forests within various international frameworks. I would like to ask everyone to give a big round of applause to Mr. Mizuno. Next is a presentation by the second speaker, Dr. Thomas Hoffer, Senior Forest Officer, Regional Office for the Asia and Pacific, UN Food and Agriculture Organization titled, 
Watershed Management for Disaster Risk Reduction. Let's welcome him. Dear colleagues and friends, it's a big honor for me to participate in this important seminar and to share a few thoughts with you about watershed management for disaster risk reduction. If you look at FAO's mandate, um, it is very clear that disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management is very, very important and is even increasing in importance. Specifically, watershed management has a very long tradition in the work of FAO, particularly in the forestry department of FAO. What I want to show with this slide is that we are, as a knowledge organization and a practical field-related organization, we are always linking our normative work or conceptual work with the field program. So we are always taking lessons from the field experiences back to our normative work to advance concepts and to bring them back to the field for validation. And you see here just a few points about the recent study where we looked at 12 recently completed projects from different parts of the world, and we reviewed experiences um, in project design and implementation along the uh, different steps in the watershed project cycle. And basically what I will present today is based on this kind of um, analysis. Right now, the forestry department in FAO is implementing a program which links watershed management to resilience of communities, but also of watershed services. The activities uh, are technical support, um, knowledge management and capacity development. And I'm very pleased to report that we are implementing in particular at the moment, a Japanese funded project on enhancing community resilience to climate change in mountain watersheds in the Philippines and Peru, funded by the Ministry of Agriculture, Forest and Fisheries of Japan. Now, Watersheds, just to make clear, we are all on the same page. Watersheds are drained by a water course. Watersheds are uh, highland areas, mountain areas, which have uh, usually a mosaic of different land use systems, forest, pasture, agriculture, infrastructure, etc. And um, uh, are facing certain risks. You see here some of these risks are natural, like uh, floods, like landslides, earthquakes. I will focus particularly in, my, in the, in the follow-up in my presentation on landslides, but also climate change, you know, overuse of natural resources, degradation processes, infrastructure, roads, uh, settlements, and market forces, which might um, promote agriculture production on areas which are not suited for this type of crops. Now, recently, uh, we have completed quite a big project which was funded by the Swedish Development Agency in Pakistan, following up on the big earthquake, uh, which happened in 2005. And you see the scope of this project was very broad. Stakeholders of degraded hillsides adopt a collaborative watershed management approach to natural resources management, socioeconomic development, sustainable livelihoods, and poverty reduction. So under this framework, the project implemented um, landslide stabilization in 17 watersheds which were affected by the earthquake with the overall slogan of building back better. Now, before I go into the project itself, I just want to clarify um, uh, the scope of watershed management for landslide risk mitigation. And you see two pictures from the earthquake area of Pakistan. On the left side, it's an area which has a lot of shallow landslides, on the right side, you see a, a tectonic slide where a whole valley has collapsed, uh, collapsed right along the uh, fault line of the earthquake. So when we talk about watershed management and landslide risk mitigation, we are basically talking about reality situations on the left side. On the, um, events like the ones on the right side, they are natural events where uh, there is no way to stabilize. It's basically nature over time, which has to uh, deal with this. The steps we took in this project, you see in these 17 watersheds, first we did a mapping exercise of the damage, you know, caused by the watershed, um, sorry about uh, from the earthquake. Um, we did a mapping of 
land cover, we look at, uh, we did a participated rural appraisal. We wanted to understand the institution situation. Then we established watershed committees in each of these watersheds where we had a multi-stakeholder participation from the local communities, from farmers' organizations, from women's groups, uh, teachers, uh, NGOs, but also line agencies who participated. And these watershed committees, they, they established the watershed management plans. They proposed activities which were rich in ideas, especially, but maybe low in investment so that the scope to upscale and to replicate these interventions beyond the project areas and beyond the project duration was uh, given. Then uh, the project implemented a number of priorities, prioritized activities, and the whole process was accompanied by capacity building and training. And finally, at the end, uh, as usual, we did an impact uh, assessment and an analysis of the lessons learned. This is probably the most important slide of this short presentation, ladies and gentlemen, because it shows the approach we followed in uh, each of these watersheds. Because our um, thinking was that a landslide is always part of a bigger picture. It's part of a landscape of a space. So when we look at landslide stabilization, we should not just look at the landslide area, but we should look at the bigger environment to make the uh, to make the intervention sustainable and to create resilience. So what you see here in the center is a watershed management plan of one of these 17 watersheds. You see different um, symbols for different activities. And I just want to explain a few of these. You know, if I take here, if I start up here, obviously landslide stabilization, we had to uh, implement some traditional engineering structures. Um, but then we also introduced a very interesting um, innovation in this area, which is bioengineering, where we use local, mainly fast-growing tree species to stabilize the slopes uh, uh, with, with, uh, with, with uh, their root systems and so on. Then we looked at uh, improved forest management, which in this area is, is growing hand in hand with pasture management. Then the watershed management plan also in, in, included some repair of damaged agriculture terraces, some innovation. You see here, sorry, uh, you see here a, um, a new, newly constructed house with a water harvesting tank. And this one here was a very strong innovation in terms of livelihood improvement. These are kitchen gardens which were introduced by the project to improve the um, the, uh, the nutritional diversity of the families, but also to improve the income situation of the households because there was always some surplus and this created additional income. So what I want to show, and that's my main message here with this, um, with this slide, is that when we talk about watershed management for disaster risk reduction, we always take a very, very broad approach because the aim is ultimately to create environment resilience, livelihood resilience, and also establish institutional mechanisms which ultimately continue with this effort. And with this approach here I'm showing, I showed very practically, I think we were quite successful. A few take home messages. Watershed management is a very appropriate and modern approach to disaster risk management and mitigation. I hope I was able to um, to illustrate this. Watershed management contributes to landscape and livelihood resilience, very important. Forests play a key role in disaster risk management as a component of a broader landscape approach. Participatory, multi-stakeholder and interdisciplinary approaches are required at all levels. On this slide you see a few resources, you know, which are, uh, which could be interesting for um, this seminar and for the audience. And with this, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity and to all of you for listening to this presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Hoffer, thank you very much. We have learned that the FAO has been working on various national initiatives to 
manage planning in a comprehensive manner, including agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, and other land uses in each watershed in a manner that contributes to the welfare of the people in order to promote effective disaster management. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Dr. Hoffer a big round of applause in your hearts. Next is the third speaker, Dr. Manzul Kumar Hazarika, director of the Geoinformatics Center Asia Institute of Technology, which is located in Bangkok, Thailand, and attracts talented people from all over Asia to conduct research and educational activities. He will deliver a presentation titled, Risk Changes, an Open Source Tool for Multi-Hazard Risk Assessment and Decision Making. Today, I'm going to talk about an open source tool for multi-hazard risk assessment and decision making, and it is called Risk Changes. I am Manjul Kumar Hazarika from SM Institute of Technology in Thailand, and I have got inputs for this presentation from Professor Case Van Westen and Mr. Roshuk Tahal from ITC University of Twenty in the Netherlands. First of all, I will uh, talk about the special representation of multi-hazards. So uh, multi-hazard risk or risk, first component hazard and exposure, which we uh, measure the special temporal probability using the environmental factors, triggering factors and hazard inventory. Where you can make a, a flood uh, maps in this case, five year, 10 year, 25 and Hundred year flood maps, which is basically a probability. Then vulnerability, which is mostly we are talking about physical vulnerability for buildings, infrastructure, etc. With a degree of loss to this uh, element at risk, you know, buildings and uh, infrastructure, which we get from the field. Uh, in this case, this is a x axis is flood depth or intensity, y axis is the damage for different buildings. And third component is this exposure, which is basically hazard map and the uh, other uh, satellite map or any other map you um, superimpose and you get the exposed area. And that we uh, need to uh, quantify in terms of numbers or amount. So this is uh, one multi-hazard risk assessment work we have done in Tajikistan and this website is a this portal is available you can uh, see and uh, this portal provides risk profile for administrative unit in Tajikistan. you can query hazard exposure loss and risk information but uh, there are some more requirements a risk assessment tool is required in-house in Tajikistan. data updating at local level they want also they want to see the future risk scenario so with that background, we got motivation to develop these risk changes. And there are several um, existing uh, risk uh, or uh, exposure assessment tool. Uh, these are INSF, RISCscape, OpenQuake, Hazus, and Capra. Uh, then, but uh, most uh, of them are not really to multi hazard risk assessment in open source. Um, uh, they are often too complex or data in intensive. Many of them are country or region specific in case uh, INSF is a developed for Indonesia. Uh, often lacking multi hazard interactions and also often lacking future seniors and risk reduction alternatives. So, our uh, workflow in our risk centers, uh, we have uh, data input hazard element at risk and vulnerabilities. Then we do the exposure analysis, then loss, and then this kind of in terms of annual average loss. So this is the interface for the element at risk. You can enter your element at risk building infrastructure information to the system. And which could be a point or lines or building footprints or land parcels. This is a hazard model. You can uh, input your hazard maps, flood or earthquake, landslide, whatever. And then uh, this is, you can see, uh, this is a landslide and debris flow uh, uh, in a particular area. 
and then there's a flood on the right side. So you can bring other hazards also if it exists in that maybe earthquake hazard maps, everything combined together in one platform. And then we go for vulnerability model, which is basically uh, damage functions for different intensity of hazards. And you can see these functions we have developed uh, in the system you can develop. There, are, uh, there is a library of uh, this kind of functions for different hazards and different type of building, but it needs to be customized a little bit depending on their building types uh, in, in each country or its region. So then uh, uh, we can do the risk assessment and also we can try to find some risk reduction alternatives. For example, here, uh, the area uh, I have already shown, the alternative one is engineering solution. For example, slope is stabilization uh, or flood risk reduction, you can put these uh, environments or those things. And with this intervention, your hazard changes and also risk changes to some extent. Similarly, ecological measures where like uh, slope stabilization, like for plantation of forests or grass, are also some simple auto harvesting uh, structures you put, and your hazard will be uh, uh, changes the uh, the pattern of the hazard because of this intervention, and also your the ultimate risk will be changes partly. And on the other hand, uh, there is another one is uh, relocation of the um, people uh, in those areas. Then you have to give compensation, environmental or social safeguard, all those things, and uh, there is no change in hazard. Hazard remain at this, and risk will be uh, also changing. Uh, <clears throat> so for, this can be used for decision making. Uh, you can see that uh, there are different alternatives, as I mentioned, and different years, 2014, 20, 30, and 2040. This kind of uh, future um, changes in land use, population, or climate change, you can, you can make a comprehensive uh, planning for uh, risk in development. In conclusions, the multi hazard risk assessment is the first and foremost requirement for identifying and prioritizing for risk reduction efforts. Existing risk assessments will have limitations in terms of availability, usability, and complexity. So risk changes is expected to address these issues and provide an opportunity for risk in planning and development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hazarika. How to assess disaster risks and make decisions is a very important issue in disaster management. We have been informed of a very useful tool that has been developed to achieve this goal. Please give a big round of applause to Dr. Hazarika in your hearts. Let's move on to session two. In session two, three people will be giving lectures on the theme of policy and technical, technical initiatives and challenges in each country. Dr. Fu Tan Fong, Dr. Situ Ang, and Dr. Okamoto, please turn on your cameras. The speakers are Dr. Fu Tan Fong, Vice Director, Department of International Cooperation, Vietnam Academy of Forest Sciences, Mr. C. Tu Ong, Water Management Division, Myanmar Forest Department, and Dr. Takashi Okamoto, Director, Hill Slope Conservation Laboratory, Forestry and Forest Products Research Institute. There is a long history of initiatives in forest-based disaster prevention and mitigation, especially in the Asia monsoon region, which is frequently affected by typhoons and earthquakes. We would like to ask the speakers to present examples of such efforts being carrying out, carried out in Vietnam, Myanmar, and Japan, which experience many mountain disasters in particular. Dr. Fong, Mr. Ong, and Dr. Okamoto, please turn off your Zoom cameras. The first speaker, Dr. Vu Tan Fong of the Vietnam Academy of Forest Sciences will present on the topic of forest-based natural disasters mitigation in Vietnam, state and challenges. Let us welcome him. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vu Tân Phu. I work for Vietnam Academy of Forest Science. I have been working here for 26 years. It's very nice for me to join the meeting. Thank you very much for your invitation. My talk will be about the forest based natural disaster mitigation in Vietnam State and Berlin's. So let's start with uh, natural risks and disaster. In Vietnam, we have uh, several types of the natural disaster. For example, flooding in the lowland area, flat flood in the mountain area, erosion of coastline, landslide mainly in mountainous area, drought and uh, frost. So Vietnam is divided the country into eight ecoregions. So for the northeast and northwest, we have a more disaster risk on landslide, flat flood, and frost. For Red River Delta, is uh, the natural disaster is uh, flooding and erosion of coastline. For the north central coast, this area and south central coast, this area is also affected by flooding and erosion of coastline. For central highland, the main problem here is uh, about the drought and landslide with the central area. And whole this area is Mekong River Delta is a flooding, erosion, and soil intrusion because of the sea level rise. The natural disaster has caused a lot of significant losses uh, to the access of the people and also the other, you know, transportation, for example. So over the period from 2006 to 2020. We have uh, average loss uh, is about 1 billion US dollar annually. So under the climate change, the uh, World Bank estimated that 60% of land area and 71% of population are exposed to natural risks and disaster annually. And of course, this uh, loss can be from uh, 0.8 to 1% of the GDP. So that is quite, you know, uh, considerable uh, losses caused by natural disaster. Uh, many things the natural disaster of Vietnam has uh, different organization uh, responsible for those issues. We have uh, two important national committee, one for incident disaster response and another one is uh, natural disaster prevention so those are two com committee are you know chaired and led by the government uh, especially the prime uh, minister so for the natural disaster prevention we also have uh, some branches uh, office in different level for example provincial level district level and common level. So for any event of the natural disaster or including the incident natural disaster response and the natural disaster prevention, we follow the principle that is a four on-site response approach. So this includes the commanding, uh, preparation of the personal forces and preparing the logistic and also mean and material for any even of natural disaster, including the natural disaster prevention. So in terms of forest-based natural disaster mitigation, we have uh, done a number of the forest-based measure. For example, we implement the uh, afforestation, reforestation on non-forest area, forest uh, restoration and sustainable forest management. Second is uh, we also have uh, some specific uh, national program, for example, forest tree development to program uh, to this respond to the climate change, like uh, we focus in the coastal forest and also the water set restoration and management. And the next one, we also focus on the controlling the forest conversion, especially the conversion of the natural forest. We also the promote the plantation development uh, for solar, it means the plantation with a long-term rotation. Uh, and we prioritize uh, using the native tree species. And on the other hand, we also implement the agroforestry uh, in the mountain node area 
for improving the ecosystem services and livelihoods of the local community. And we also carry out a number of research to select three species and to develop the silvicultural measure uh, suitable for climate change and natural disaster mitigation. Of course, we also face some gap and challenge in terms of the developing the poetry based measure for natural disaster mitigation. The first is about the forest forecasting capacity it's still uh, limited and like the retail, normally we don't have uh, like a micro level uh, forecast or something like that. Uh, and it also very, very challenging to have a good uh, forecast uh, for the extreme climate, even for example, uh, flat floods, landslide, and coastline erosion. Second is we also like uh, the technical requirement and investment or construction work in the mountainous area, for example, road construction or any other construction work in the mountainous area to mitigate the disaster risk. And we also face a limited understanding on the interaction between the forest and the natural disaster mitigation. For example, uh, what are the best tree species uh, and also the minimum forest area uh, cover and its distribution. Uh, and, and this is very important for the uh, policy option and designing the threat based measure for natural disaster mitigation. And we also have uh, some other challenge is the lack of requirement for fresh logging. Uh, for example, during the logging, we also have to construct the road for transportation of the timber and also how to, to you know, uh, design the cut area that can contribute to mitigation of natural disaster. And the last one is uh, also the limitation of the integration of the natural disaster prevention into the planning processes and also into the, you know, uh, development of the, uh, you know, the land use uh, plan or something like that. That are the key uh, gap and challenge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vu Tan Fong. We have learned that in Vietnam, in order to control the damage caused by the frequent occurrence of natural disasters, various governmental organizations related to disaster prevention are working together and forest-based solutions are being attempted. And it is important to further develop such research and capacity building in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Dr. Fong in your hearts. Next, the second speaker, Mr. Si Tu Aung of the Water Management Division, Myanmar Forest Department, will present on the topic of Inle Lake Integrated Watershed Management jointly implemented by the Forest Department of Myanmar and JICA. Let's welcome him. Hello, nice to meet you all. My name is Sidhu from Myanmar Forest Department. So today I'm going to talk about the integrated lake watershed management jointly implemented by the Forest Department and the JICA. So this is the agenda of my presentation. So this is the location of the project. Uh, here is Myanmar and this is the location of the state and region of the uh, any lake, and this is the inner lake watershed area. So, as you may have already known, this lake has very famous features. This lake is famous, you know, uh, due to the the reason that people, a lot of people, are living inside the lake. Forty-five villages and around hundred thousand people are living in the lake. So, this is the uh, second largest uh, inland inner lake in Myanmar, and very high biodiversity. And one of the Important thing of this lake is this is this lake uh, has been providing you know a lot of uh, um, electricity to the people around the lake. Uh, this is the location of the lake, and this uh, what is the area is wide for five five point six hundred uh, square kilometer, and the very first you know man and balance we are uh, we call it MEP. 
So this lake has 29 streams uh, flowing into the lake. Mainly, you know, four streams uh, um, flowing year round, and the only one outlet of the lake. And this is the biodiversity richness in, in this lake. So, what are the challenge issues? The challenges, as you can see here, this lake has uh, the reduced surface area of open water and declining water quality declining, and sediment management, especially in the uh, lakeside zones, and swine erosion, and you know agricultural productivity, which has effect on the socio-economy of the people and threats to the human health and the uh, ecotourism development and climate change. So those are the, uh, in 2010, because of the rise temperature, uh, the, there, there was a big drought, as you can see here, and also as a consequence, the water, water scarcity has happened in this area. So this is the water pollution sources. And this, those photos, photos show the tourism development, which has impact on the lake, uh, the health of the lake. And this illegal fishing. And just pick up the worst cases, you know, uh, as you can see here, 2010, 2015, 15, very big difference. At that time, you know, in 2010, the transportation was a very big problem in this lake and the unsystematic collection of the waste around the lake. So what, what will be our efforts? We have two types of effort against those challenges. The first is the buying energy cooperation like JICA, buying the government with government support. So I'll, I'll talk about the JICA first. This is the background information of the JICA project. This is a five-year project. And the formulation of the of this FTS and our project is during our you know uh, state councilor visit to Japan, and the, the, the two leaders has agreed to urgently launch the project. So basically, this project has three components: component one is capacity development, component two is watershed management, and component three is biodiversity conservation. So component one is capacity building; those are the devices that we are use we use for the sustainable forest management and this is uh, this the forest monitoring tools training by the component one and this is uh, component two is uh, watershed management so those are divided to use the watershed management in the lake and this is the joint forest management uh, you know this is kind of forest management where the people Participation, participation is very crucial. And this picture shows the Kali erosion control. And this, those are the you know, places where the um, watershed management devices are installed. So this, is, this project has two uh, project uh, sub management units composed of the local people, you know, line departments, and other CSOs. So this is the component three. Component three is a uh, biodiversity database system. In other words, this is biodiversity research center construction, stay in the process. So against the COVID-19, we improve to make the work plan better, and then you know, develop some up training materials. So th this is the way how we are monitoring and evaluating this project led by our Thailand General of the Forest Department. So for more information, you can visit this website, which is the website of the FTSNA project. So by the government, we have a very big project for last for 30 years, we call it IWRP. So the long vision of the project is, as you can see here, sustainability of the ecosystem service of the lake and the uh, socioeconomic development of the people. So this is the formation of the, this project. Our company leader visited to the lake and then they commanded to launch this project. So basically this, this project has uh, six components, as you can see here. Component one, sustaining watershed ecosystem services, component two, tree planting, and so on. So in, around, you know, among these six component, component one and component three, those are the components that we can uh, work together with the uh, 
abuse and project component too. So we develop, we organize the program steering committee to monitor this project, which include the states and region ministers in this project area. So our expectation is to, you know, uh, develop watershed policy, laws and guidelines, since we have no such kind of uh, document in the past. And the biology joint forest management and payment for ecosystem services scheme, and also the, the lake systems process that we have already discussed, which is Suwa Lake in Japan and Inga Lake in Myanmar. That's the way forward. So the main, our design to uh, aim to work in the future is to integrate these two projects as a national priority because uh, uh, this the nature of this project, uh, FG, SNR, and NWRP have the, the very similar outcome and you know uh, expected output. So we have to for the government project and NWRP, we need to take the take the technical assistance from the FG SNR project. So this is the way forward as a whole of, of our plan. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Situ Aung. We have learned that the technical cooperation with JICA at Inle Lake has produced wonderful results, such as the development of technology to control soil erosion and introduction of a system to, system to monitor and analyze river conditions, and that this is being put into practice along with various other initiatives by the Myanmar, Myanmar government. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Mr. Aung a big round of applause in your hearts. The final presentation in session two is by Dr. Takashi Okamoto, Director, Hill Slope Conservation Laboratory, Forest and Forest Products Research Institute, on the topic, Research on FDRR by FFPRI, Toward Prevention and Mitigation of Sediment-Related Disasters. Let us welcome him now. Hello, everyone. I am Takashi Okamoto from FFPRI. Now I will present on research on FDRR by FFPRI toward mitigation and prevention of sediment-related disasters. I wish to offer topics for discussion. First, I will talk about the global intensification and drastic increase in sediment-related sediment disasters and recent movements. These extreme events, like increasingly frequent heavy rainfall, as a result of climate change, tend to intensify sediment-related disasters in our country and abroad. Also, in developing countries, uncontrolled land use change, such as the conversion of forest to farmland, has aggravated disasters. The importance of preventing and mitigating sediment-related disasters has recently been recognized in the context of international cooperation such as the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework for DRR, and Japan's Infrastructure Systems Export Strategy. Our approach to preventing such sediment-related disasters is FDRR, which is also the theme of today's presentation. The forested hill slope conservation in Japan aims to increase resilience to such disasters through a combination of forest maintenance and subsidized projects. This is in line with FDRR concept. In addition, from the point of view of improving the disaster prevention function while maintaining the forest, it can contribute to the prevention and mitigation of sediment-related disasters in Japan and in developing countries. Now, what kind of research has been carried out on FDRR in Japan? has been used for a long time to evaluate the landslide prevention function of the tree root system. The idea is that tree roots can resist sliding by penetrating the underground sliding surface. In Japan, this resist re uh, resistance has long been quantified and evaluated. Now that I have explained a little about Japan's hill slope conservation efforts, 
I would like to talk about a project to apply such technologies abroad. This is the project on development of technologies to enhance the functions of forests for disaster risk reduction in developing countries. The seminar is also a part of this project. The project started in 2020, subsidized by the Forestry Agency of Japan. The aim of the project is to develop methodologies to apply Japan's local techniques to enhance the disaster prevention and mitigation functions of forests in developing countries, including ASEAN. The first year of this project was carried out by FFPRI. There are three main issues to be addressed. One is research and analysis of the challenges of applying Japan's local hill slope conservation technologies to developing countries by way of interviews and literature review. Secondly, the development of technologies through the actual application of Japanese hill slope conservation technologies to local conditions abroad. We aim to identify the effects and challenges and solutions. And finally, the dissemination of information. The last step is, uh, last step is to disseminate the result of the first and second steps to the world. In promoting this project, FFPRI chose Vietnam as the country for our research. Last year, we signed the MOU with the Vietnamese Academy of Forest Sciences to conduct joint research. In Vietnam, as in Japan, there is an increase in extreme torrential rains due to climate change. This has led to an increase in slope failure, landslides, and debris flows. This is also an area where disasters are becoming more serious as the land use changes. I will explain the flow of technology development, which is a centerpiece of this project. This will involve the development of Japanese risk mapping and forest hill slope conservation technologies for the local application. The five-year process is shown in this diagram. Firstly, in collaboration with VAFS, research sites were established in the northern mountains in Vietnam to study the characteristics of landslides, the state of forest road network development, and the sociological background. We will also carry out the remote sensing survey in the same area using satellite images to determine the location of sliding, top topography, geology, and vegetation cover. The information is then used as input for GIS analysis to produce risk maps of sediment-related hazards in the region. This is how Japanese hill slope conservation technology is applied in the field. In addition to the significance and potential of exporting technology to developing countries, there will be a number of problems arising from the actual application of the technology. In this project, we will extract such problems one by one and find solutions to them in order to develop methods for applying the technology to developing countries. Here is one of the GIS interpretation technology, automatic extraction of landslides. In Japan, automatic extraction of landslide using satellite images has been developed. We are trying to apply this technology to the mountains in Vietnam to clarify the validity and possible problems. Here is a result of applying this automated extraction to satellite images in Vietnam. As you can see here, one of the problems we have found is that the mountains in Vietnam are covered by clouds for a longer time than in Japan. And therefore, there are more areas that cannot be analyzed than we had expected. In order to solve these problems, it will be necessary to actively use a wide range of satellite imagery, including SAR, synthetic aperture laser imagery, 
which is unaffected by cloud cover. Last but not least, we will continue to disseminate the result of this project in various ways. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Director Okamoto. Dr. Okamoto introduced the FDRR Technology Research and Development Project conducted jointly with Vietnam utilizing Japanese hill slope conservation techniques, which was started this year under the Project on Development of Technologies to Enhance FDRR in Developing Countries. Please give a big round of applause to Dr. Okamoto. From here, we will start the panel discussion. In the panel discussion, the panelists will have a discussion based on the contents of the lectures so far. Mr. Mizuno, Dr. Hoffer, Dr. Hazarika, Dr. Fuong, Mr. Ang, and Director Okamoto, please turn your cameras on. In this panel discussion, Dr. Takeshi Toma, Director of the Center for International Partnerships and Research on Climate Change at the Forest and Forest Products Research Institute, will serve as moderator. Then, Director Toma, please get started. I am Takeshi Toma of the Forest and Forest Products Research Institute. Though the time is limited, I will do my best to facilitate so we have a fruitful discussion. First, I will introduce the questions from participants that came by chat. I ask our speakers to answer them. Thank you for your cooperation. First, there is a question to Dr. Hoffer from someone from Pakistan who is currently studying at Hiroshima University. Dr. Hoffer, what were the methods that were suitable for stabilizing the soil and land surface in your project site? Dr. Hoffer, please respond. Thank you, and I already replied, in fact, to the um, colleague in, in the directly. Very interesting question. And what we did in this project, you know, as you saw on my second last slide, was really to combine the traditional engineering structures with bioengineering. And bioengineering proved to be the most successful. And when we talk about bioengineering, it's different techniques, you know, of palisade planting, of waddling, and so on. It's basically using local tree species, fast-growing tree species, to stabilize the slopes, to stabilize landslides. And why they were very successful, there were two reasons. The first is because they are ultimately more stable than engineering structures, because once these trees have, you know, the root system developed, they really anchor the soil much more and much more long-term than uh, engineering structures. And the second reason was very interesting because these were almost no cost activities. I mean, it's a technique, but um, the cost to use this technique was almost zero because it's basically local species. And there was a capacity building of the local communities how to do this bioengineering. So there was no cost involved ultimately, except the labor and the time of people. So we saw, you know, five years after the earth, after this project was completed, we went back to see the situation. <clears throat> and we saw that, especially these bioengineering measures, they were widely replicated beyond the project site. They were replicated, you know, um, in other landslide areas, they were replicated on road sites and so on. Very successful because of this um, low cost, but rich in ideas technology. So these were the two reasons. One is the technique, you know, to really use plants with their root systems. And the other one was um, the, the very low uh, financial input. And in countries, you know, where um, in low income countries, this is very, very important and uh, uh, very, in, in, in fact, successful. I hope I replied to the question which was posed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hoffer. 
Another question about tree planting to stabilize the soil surface has been received for you. You said that you are introducing fast-growing species, but what are your thoughts about endemic species? Dr. Hoffer, could you please answer the question? Um, absolutely. I mean, we only used local species, but what I'm saying is that within the local species, you have a number of rather fast growing species like uh, local willows or, or uh, um, this kind of, of species. And so 100% agreed, I mean, we didn't use any species which was not um, endemic, which was not uh, a species of the sites. Why I say it's important to have, if possible, you know, fast growing species because to really have, how do you say, if you want to stabilize slopes, I mean, you, you, it, it should be a process which doesn't take too much time. So that's why we, we, we looked for a fast growing species, but only local species were used, nothing else, no, no exotic species. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think the answer was very clear. Actually, due to simultaneous interpretation, I am speaking in Japanese, but the questions were sent to me in English and I translated them into Japanese once. So please forgive me if it sounds a bit awkward. Another question to Dr. Hoffer is on a larger topic but I would like to ask it later during the overall panel discussion. Meanwhile, I have received two other questions for Mr. Situ Aung. The first is, what are the differences between joint forest management and community forestry in Myanmar? Mr. Situ Aung, could you please answer? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, for the question. And this is very a uh, good question to be clarified. Even, you know, myself, I'm still studying. I mean, the community forestry is, is very much famous since long time ago in Myanmar. But then uh, joint forest management would be very much pioneer for Myanmar. That's why, you know, um, we asked to JAIGA to pioneerly implement uh, in the project area of the JAIGA FDSNR project. Basically, how I understand between I mean, the difference between these two types is that, you know, community forestry is uh, it's not as wide as the joint forest management because in joint forest management, when I study other, other you know, case from other country, joint forest management has, I mean, a lot of comedies like budget comedy, you know, technical comedy and wagi comedy. But in, in the case of the community forestry in Myanmar, we only have the, we don't really have many comedy, but in this type of the forest management, uh, we only organize the user group. User group means, the a set of the group, group of the local, local community. And in the case of Myanmar Community for, Forestry uh, Instruction, we have to organize at least 5% for the group, for the user group. And this 5% will have the one leader. So this, uh, by the guidance of the forest department, and by the technical assistance from the forest department, those user groups are managing their forest by themselves and they have the right to extract the forest product from the community forestry and sell out by themselves with the help of the forest department. So in the case of joint forest management, this is much more wider than the community forestry because the joint forest management has a lot of property, as I said to you before. So in terms of the joint forest management, we are still studying how could we make best for this compared to the community forestry. So, was my answer right? 
Thank you very much. There is one more question related to this answer from Mr. Ma of the ITTO. It may have already been partially answered, but the question is, what are the benefits to people from the activities of joint forest management? I believe this question comes from the perspective that improving people's livelihoods is very important. Mr. Situ Aung, could you please respond to this question? Uh, yes. I would say that, you know, this is also a good question and difficult question for me to answer right now because, as I said to you before, uh, I think I should talk first about the, the formation of the Joint Forest Management in Myanmar in this project area because, uh, you know, the Jaiga Project experts proposed the area to implement the community forestry in the southern part of the near by the lake, which is the water area of the lake. So that their proposed area falls into the our reserve forest area, which is you know uh, managed by our ministry. But in the this proposed area falls into the economic plantation of the uh, forest. So based on the you know community for the instruction of Myanmar, community forestry cannot be established in such area, which is the economic plantation. So, but the people in this area already, uh, you know, they, they have already wanted to conserve this forest by standards since before. So one of the possible, you know, uh, possible mechanism in order for them to be able to Today, by themselves, is to establish the joint forest management as a pioneer pioneer uh, platform. So, uh, to be able to answer your question very precisely, we are now just testing for the GFI in this area by the help of the technical assistance from the Chaiga H part in collaboration with our forest department. So, but my expectation of the GFI implementation in this area will be a very, you know, uh, very good tool to, to manage the forest in this area because by the, 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 the benefits of the GFM, the way how I understand it would be, the, for example, the water resources in this area, the people already have willingness to you know, conserve this forest for their water. Mm -hmm. And they can even extract some of the forest product in this area for their economy. So the benefits would be would not be very different from community forest and joint forest management, but the system is a bit different. This is my uh, understanding right now. Do you get my point? Thank you very much. I hope that this joint forest management initiative will improve the relationship between people and forests more than ever. We have received other questions, but due to time constraints, I would like to move on to the discussion with the panelists on methods and challenges for maximizing the potential of forest-based disaster risk reduction. First of all, I would like to ask Dr. Manzo Kumar Hazarika of AIT and Dr. Okamoto of Forest and Forest Products Research Institute about the technical, technical aspects. The following question was received for the two of you by chat. So please also share your thoughts on this question. Dr. Manzo and Dr. Okamoto, you introduced risk analysis methods. How do you check the correctness or accuracy of the answers? That is the question. I think this is a difficult question to answer because it concerns a very important part of disaster prevention measures. I would like to ask Dr. Manzu to first respond. 
Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> for, so I think uh, I agree. It is uh, uh, not that easy to assess the accuracy, but all uh, I can say, your accuracy will depend on how accurate input data to this uh, models or this uh, framework. So first of all, uh, there are two things. One thing is the hazard and exposure assessment. And most of the cases, you can see this uh, hazard area and then what are the uh, uh, element that is exposed. Uh, while I am explaining in my presentation mostly uh, infrastructure buildings, but it can be also some forest area or agriculture area, methodology is same. So for hazard assessment and exposure assessment, I think that is now it is pretty pretty uh, accurate because we use uh, satellite images uh, in many cases. So you exactly know that what are the area affected by a particular hazard. So uh, that part is quite, quite, I think, measured also. Models are also very good for hazard, say flood hazard, or tsunami hazard assessment, earthquake. Uh, those are quite good. But of course, you need some long-term data to uh, make uh, high accuracy for that. Now, on the other hand, the vulnerability assessment, which we normally collect data in the field, in the, say, suppose in a particular location, if a one meter flood happens, how much damage to the agricultural crops or maybe forest, uh, some forest area or whatever. Uh, also, duration of that particular, uh, particular uh, uh, hazard, say flood for, in some cases, it can maybe a few days or even weeks. So it all depends on, uh, and then you have to collect these damage, corresponding damage. So that part is a little bit, uh, uh, very little bit uh, difficult because you need data from the uh, ground and accuracy of data, this kind of data is difficult to ascertain in many cases. So uh, nowadays what we are doing is we are trying to develop some mobile phone applications. So people when the hazard happened, they can take a photograph and give some description and then we link to the satellite data. And uh, we believe that with this kind of ground information as well as from, from a space with satellite, uh, this accuracy can be increased. And then we combine this uh, to get together to get the risk assessment. So overall, I would say it all depends on the how accurate input data uh, to define this accuracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, Dr. Okamoto, please. Thank you very much for the question. I think this is a very important issue, but at the same time, it is a very difficult one. To give you a practical example of what we are doing in our project, we are using satellite imagery and then using GIS analysis to try to find areas of high risk. The first thing we do is to go to the sites where landslides are thought to have occurred and see if they have actually occurred. We will do this at several or several dozen locations. After that, we will look at the satellite images, point out the location in the satellite images, and, for instance, correlate the color of the location, the color, etc., of the satellite image, and the, the fact that it is a collapsed area. By doing this, it is possible to automatically extract the location of collapsed areas in a wider area, as I had explained in one of my slides a while ago. After that, the topography, geology, slope, vegetation cover, etc., of the area where the collapse actually occurred are given one by one as parameters. And the areas with high risk are narrowed down based on what kind of environment is likely to cause slopes to collapse. It is still very difficult to determine the correct answer rate. In some cases, we will only be able to tell when heavy rain actually falls and landslides either occur in the area or not. But we expect that the correct answer rate will increase through the repetition of such efforts. That's all.
Thank you very much. We learned that even if we use the latest technologies, it is very important to check them on site. Next, I would like to ask Mr. Si Tu Aung from Myanmar and Dr. Fu Tan Phuan from Vietnam to share with us the needs and expectations of forest-based disaster risk reduction in their respective countries. And also the challenges in realizing FDRR. First, Mr. C2, um, please tell us about Myanmar. Yes, uh, thank you for, for this opportunity. Uh, I think I have already talked about some of the you know, aspects since yesterday, the session. Uh, today, I, I, I just would like to talk a little bit more uh, than, than yesterday. You know, uh, the forest resources has been you know, uh, significantly declining in Myanmar, as, as you have already known. So, uh, and also deforestation is also rapidly you know, growing up uh, gradually and gradually. So, how, you know, actually the, the system, forest management system in Myanmar is, is good enough because you know, since many years ago, we have been applying this technique for the forest management. But why forest resources are declining? This is, I mean, controversial, very difficult to understand. So, in my understanding, because you know, uh, the the relationship between forest forest resources and disaster prevention is is, is very clear. As you may know, in 2008, we have been facing, you know, very, very um, big cyclone in, in Aavri region of Myanmar. But people, after this Nagis cyclone, people have significant, you know, awareness to maintain the mangrove forest. So people need to deeply understand about the condition. But as long as they don't face the problem, they don't have the, I mean, they don't have the willingness, they don't have the awareness. But this is very good example of the people in this region, you know, uh, deeply understood the value of the mangrove forest because they, they have been facing a lot of, you know, um, negative impact from the disaster. So, and then the, the, the people in this region now left to conserve the mangrove since before. So the mangrove area in this, in this region has been you know, increasing very uh, rapidly because they, they, they are now understanding how mangrove forests are important for the coastal community. So this is, uh, in other words, people need to have the real realistic understanding of the forest products, no, not for the forest resources. So uh, talking about, you know, the forestry, uh, Deforestation in Myanmar. We have we we have very good policy laws and enforcement and guidelines, but just we have most of the people do not really um, obey the law. So no matter how you have very good policy and law, if people do not obey the law, then it is nothing, right? So this is uh, one of the very uh, good, um, you know, good information why our forest resources are declining over time. And also, I, I just already talked about this yesterday, the, the, even the government's mechanism needs to have the very good governance, right? Because even, as you may know, uh, my, the name of my ministry is Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Conservation. Mm. So the name is very good, but what is happening now is it's not really in line with the ministry name. I mean, we are trying, but how much we are trying, we, for example, in my case, I work hard, but forest resources are even declining. Mm. So as I told you before, we have very good policy, but 
the governance, uh, government and the people needs to have the trust. Yes. So what I want to say is we have to build the trust first based on the, you know, lesson learned from before. So the trust is one of the very good tools to conserve our natural resources. So you know, it's certainly saying the, the, the law enforcement and the trust and the private sector involvement, like I told you before, and the people participation, these four factors will be the main challenges for Myanmar in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. C. Tu An explained a very difficult problem, which he clearly organized into four main challenges. Now I would like to ask Dr. Phong from Vietnam to explain the situation about the country. Dr. Phong, please. Yes, so thank you so much. So, yes, so I, I think we are now facing the environment challenge, not only for any country, but for many, many countries and region in the world. And uh, of course, Vietnam has a long coastline, about 3,000 kilometers. And Vietnam is seen the most vulnerable countries uh, under the climate change impact. So I think uh, many, many, I think a lot of measures are being developed to mitigate the natural disaster, to reduce the losses and damages. So I think to improve uh, the implementation of the natural disaster mitigation or reduction, in my point of view, I think we should have a, a good understanding based on the research uh, results for the four, I think, uh, aspect. The first is uh, about the interaction between the forest and the natural disaster. Second is uh, the disaster risk, how to map the disaster risk, especially the extremely climate event, its impact. And the third one is about the mitigation capacity. It's the quiet, uh, you know, adaptive capacity, resources, and so on. And the third, I think, is about how to uh, identify the losses and damage in case the absence of the mitigation measure. So I think those information is very important for the policymaker for planning processes, for example, whether we should uh, follow the landscape planning approach or whether we, we use the integrated uh, planning approach. The second is uh, this should support the designing the technical intervention. Like I said in the presentation that uh, we, we know the forest play an important role in the you know, mitigation of the disaster. But we don't know exactly, or we should know exactly where the forest should be, and and what are the scale the forest should be to have uh, you know maximum effects on the disaster mitigation. And for other thing is the tree species, how the forest structure should be, and what are the tree species uh, is the best for the maybe landslide mitigation or control or something like that. And also, we have to consider the, uh, you know, the food security for the uh, community dependent uh, on the forest, something for any dependent from uh, dependent community in that area. And the next one, I think those information, I think, is very important for institutional arrangement policy to support the development or implementation of the forest-based uh, disaster reduction measure. So I think it's, it's very important. And also the last one I would like to mention is that we need to have a robust and also effective monitoring system to monitor all the you know, natural disaster for, I think, adjustment for uh, any changes in our planning processes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Developing that basic information, 
developing the technologies and providing them to policy makers and practitioners. The roles expected of research institutions were clearly explained. Based on the discussion so far, I would like to ask Dr. Thomas Hofer of FAO to share his views on the potential and challenges of forest-based disaster risk reduction from the perspective of an international organization. In addition, we have received a question from Mr. Yamazaki of the Forestry Agency in Japan asking Dr. Hofer what measures are needed to promote the idea of effective FTRR in developing countries. So, Dr. Hofer. Thank you very much for um, the question. First of all, I would like to express appreciation to Japan because you are a leading country in the world related to um, disaster risk management. I mean, you, you have such a lot of experience and I think you are really a country where disaster risk management has a, um, an experience which is really unique in the world. <clears throat> so if I understand the question correctly, what we are saying is um, it's about the effectiveness of, of forests for disaster risk reduction. And maybe I want to come back to one of the messages in my presentation, which was really the message to look at the landscape as a whole. Let me just be a bit more precise. So if you have a landslide somewhere, maybe it was triggered by an earthquake, you have obviously to address this landslide by mainly a forestry, soil conservation activities, but maybe there is upstream, there is an irrigation canal, which is leaking, you know, which is bringing water into this, into this slope. So if we just look at the slide and the forest area, maybe we don't address the whole picture. So we need to address also the agricultural part of it. Or maybe there is a pasture area somewhere which is overusing the, the resources and then, then creating soil instability, slope instability. So my message once again is to say, uh, when we look at the role of forests in disaster risk management, we have to look at a landscape approach. We have to see how forest is part of a mosaic of land use systems, of agriculture, pasture, and so on. So if we look at at this holistically, then we manage not just to treat a symptom or a direct danger, but to create a broader resilience, an environmental resilience, a livelihood resilience. And we talked earlier this afternoon also about the whole question of um, climate change and the role of forests. So when we take this holistic approach, we also create a diversification of options, be it in the forest itself, but also in other land use systems. And with this, we also create more resilience, not just to hazards like a, like a flood or like a, an earthquake, but also to more long-term trends like climate change. And to do that properly, and I think it was mentioned also earlier in the afternoon, we need to also address institutional arrangements. So I focused very much on this watershed committee, which is needed, you know, at the, at the local level. So if we want to have this holistic approach, we need to bring all these actors together, not just the forestry people, we need to bring um, the agriculture people together. And in the field, this is quite easy to do because farmers, they have holistic view already because that's the, what they are doing but at the government level if we want to institutionalize the approach we need to cross administrative boundaries we need to bring forestry people agriculture people pasture managers livestock people um, and so on together to work together on disaster risk reduction where forest obviously has a very important role to play so that's uh, so it's the landscape approach 
it's the institutional mechanism and it's the resilience creation. That's my message I wanted to give and hopefully I have replied to your question. Over to you. Thank you very much. We learned that working on the landscape level and the watershed level on a comprehensive institutional level and focusing on resilience. These three points are very important. We are starting to run short of time. So now we'd like to ask Mr. Mizuno of IGES to talk about FDRR as uh, climate change uh, countermeasures. Mizuno-san has received a question by chat as follows. How do you link FDRR with climate change adaptation measures is the question. There is another question by chat as follows. Based on the announcements and debate of the lectures so far, Dr. Mizuno, could you please express your views to us? So we ask you to please respond to these points. Thank you very much. In my presentation, uh, I emphasized a number of points which I might have to reiterate here, but broadly speaking, there are three points I would like to comment about here. First, regarding the pot pursuing the potential of forest-based DRR in the future, we really need to think solidly about adaptation as one aspect of climate change countermeasures. Let me explain. In the future, due to global warming, the climate is expected to change, and as a result, the intensity of climate-related disasters is expected to increase. Also, the patterns and frequency of such disasters is expected to change. In other words, planning our disaster risk reduction based only on past data may not be adequate. Therefore, we need to predict future climate risks and apply those predictions to policies and projects. That is the key to linking FDRR with adaptation. Regarding this point, it has been touched upon in a number of presentations. Predicting the future is not necessarily very easy, but scientific know-how for prediction needs to be strengthened in the local area. That's important, of course, but I'd like to emphasize another point. Even if the data is limited, we need to find ways to predict the climate risks of the future and apply those predictions to forest-based risk, disaster risk reduction. We need to find simple methods to pre predict future risks and apply that to DRR. We need to develop methodologies and tools for this. On the other hand, Many people complain that there is a lack of data so they can't predict the future, but rather than giving up because we don't have data, we should learn how to use our available limited data and think what approach is best to develop optimal climate ch change countermeasures. That is one first point, important point. Secondly, uh, this is related to the fact we need to think about adaptation. There's a point I want to emphasize. As uh, Dr. Asano mentioned in the beginning, regarding climate change countermeasures, there is a big momentum now in uh, mitigation to achieve a net zero emission society. But there's also a large international momentum to work on adaptation as well. We need to collaborate with international efforts on adaptation and find new partnerships. That will be very important. There's a number of meaning, meanings to this. There's a large momentum by riding on the bandwagon. We may be able to scale up our efforts for forest-based disaster risk reduction by being part of that movement. Through that, we can understand the needs and challenges in different countries 
And on the basis of understanding of the needs and challenges, it will be possible to do more appropriate initiatives. Various best practices are also emerging, so we can learn from those best practices. In that sense, it's important for us to link with international moves that w and follow them. That's very important. I shouldn't go on too long, but there's one more point listening to what uh, was said that I thought is very important. Especially in developing countries, when thinking of adaptation, regional en engagement and stakeholder engagement is very important from various perspectives, I think. Firstly, people in the locality know best about what is happening in the locality. We have learned that from our own experience. So local experience needs to be applied to adaptation countermeasures. That's very important. And the second point is that there is no right answer about adaptation. So a decision must be made somewhere, somehow. As you make a decision, it is critical to make sure people who are most affected will be able to participate in a process, say a process of making policies. Thirdly, adaptation is not a one-off effort. It must be sustainable. In that sense, it is important that local people have a sense of ownership about measures that are taken. Listening to the local stakeholders, collaborating with them, using their knowledge for designing initiatives. I just want to emphasize the importance of all of these. Dr. Misuno, thank you very much for your comments based on a holistic, comprehensive perspective. We could just keep on discussing, but we have already exceeded the scheduled time. For the unanswered questions we received, we will try to answer them on a later date. Now, this panel discussion focused on not just FDRR, of forests or forestry, but also other sectors, including agriculture, collaboration with government, and to consider the community and their livelihood. We must make sure that we hear all of these people involved. So we learned many important lessons. These initiatives are exactly the area where our Red Plus and FDRR Research and Development Center's experience can be very useful. To fully utilize the potential of FDRR, we need to have a systematic collaboration with multiple people. We need to keep on working on this. As Red Plus and FDRR Research and Development Center, we have just made a fresh start. We wish to collaborate with all the panelists and the, all the viewers who participated today for building the better future. Thank you very much. Respected panelists, Director Toma, thank you very much. Let us give them a warm round of applause in our hearts. Dear panelists, please turn your cameras off. Let us continue to the closing session. Finally, Dr. Yasumasa Hirata, Director of FFPRI Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center, will summarize today's discussion. Director Hirata, please proceed. Dear speakers, thank you very much for your valuable information and wonderful lectures today. I think this seminar was very meaningful for us as we launch our new center and work on adaptation in the future. 
Mitigation and adaptation are the two main aspects of countermeasures against climate change. Currently, in Japan is taking major steps towards zero emissions. I think mitigation is about thinking on a global scale. Mitigation is about reducing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And in a sense, there is a time lag before our activities come back to impact us. Meanwhile, adaptation, on the other hand, is something that is directly related to our lives. And I think it will become increasingly important in the future. In particular, when we think about adaptation, there is difficulty of thinking about things at the regional level and the landscape level, as some of you mentioned in your talks. In this case, various adaptation measures will be required depending on the conditions of each region, such as social conditions and natural conditions. In today's talk, Mr. Mizuno first talked about adaptation and how it should be handled and considered within an international framework. And then he explained the positioning of adaptation in an international framework. In addition, Dr. Thomas Hoffer Dr. Fu Tan Fong and Mr. Si Tu Aung provided us with information on how we can put adaptation into practice at the national and regional levels. Furthermore, Dr. Manzo Kumar Hazarika and Dr. Okamoto of our center talked about the development of tools that can be used for this purpose. As you can see, various efforts from the level of practice to the level of technology development will be necessary for adaptation. We at the Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center will continue to take these aspects into consideration as we conduct our activities. One good thing about this seminar is that it, it, it was held in a special manner uh, under the COVID-19 situation. We, it was attended by nearly 300 people, which is very wonderful. It was easier to participate so that a wide range of people were able to attend, which I think was quite positive. On the other hand, in the past seminars held by our center in the past, the exchange of information was not limited to the provision of information by the speakers, but it was also very valuable to exchange information among the people who came to the venue. Next year and thereon, when we hold such seminars, we will need to seek the best way forward. We can hope to continue to hold such seminars and provide information to you. Thank you very much for watching this two-hour seminar. Thank you very much for your attention. Finally, please allow me to explain about a web questionnaire we are conducting regarding today's seminar. The QR codes and URLs are posted in the program, and the questionnaire can also be accessed from the website of the Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center. Thank you for your cooperation. We received many questions on the QA form. As for the questions that could not be answered due to lack of time, we hope to answer them at a later time as much as possible. Today's lecture materials will be uploaded and made viewable on the website of the Red Plus and Forest DRR Research and Development Center, so please refer to them. We will now conclude the seminar. Thank you for your participation for more than two hours. We give our thanks to all the speakers.
to Japan International Forestry Promotion and Cooperation Center, Hibino Media Technical KK, Scientific Language KK, the staff of FFPRI, and everyone else who supported the seminar behind the scenes. We pray for the good health of the attendees and look forward to meeting you face-to-face on the next opportunity. Thank you very much.